disagree with you. But, excuse me, this is funny, Ms. Reed. We have been unable to reach a unanimous verdict. Signed by the four person. We find ourselves deeply divided by fundamental differences in our opinions and state of mind. Your service is complete. I'm declaring a mistrial in this case. There are some things that you wish that you could clarify. Is there any any He'll be clarified one day, Matt. He'll be clarified. Jurors in the Karen Reed trial are reaching out to both sides, clarifying their position on the charges, saying even if Karen Reed did hit John O'Keefe, the jury didn't think she knew it happened. This as Karen Reed is preparing to return to court this week, asking the court to dismiss the case. Our legal experts are weighing in. Also this hour, the former officer who shot Sonia Massey is explaining his interpretation of her rebuke as a deadly threat. Plus, reaction is pouring in to the sentencing of a teenager who beat a teacher's aide. Is five years behind bars an appropriate punishment? It's all next right here on Opening Statements. Welcome to Opening Statements. I'm Julia Janae, filling in this morning for Julie Grant. Thanks for being with us. This show is all about getting you ready for the day ahead in court, just like Opening Statements at a trial. And we are bringing you courtroom coverage in multiple trials today. Court TV is also tracking some important hearings that could be affecting the future trials that we watch. So let's take a look at our daily docket. Mr. Tao shot Nemo Yang. Then he shot Peng Lor. Then he shot Trevor Maloney. Day two of testimony in the triple murder over $600 trial is set to begin at 9.30 a.m. Tao is back on trial for the second time in a year after his first trial was declared a mistrial. And that's just one of the cases we're following today here on Court TV. We're also in Iowa where opening statements are slated to start at 10 a.m. in the dad in a ditch murder trial. Defendant Alec Jones stands trial for the murder of his father, Dennis, who died last April. His brother, Nathan, was charged with aiding and abetting. Both are being tried separately. Also in Kentucky, the father and son charged in the death of Crystal Rogers will be back in court. Joseph and Steve Lawson are both charged in connection with the disappearance and death of Rogers. We'll monitor any updates in that courtroom throughout the day. Our top story today, though, the new developments in the Karen Reed murder trial. At this point, multiple jurors have been reaching out to both sides, even to a reporter, saying that they are certain Karen Reed is not a killer. According to a new defense filing from Monday, a jury, juror rather, called attorney David Yannetti, revealing that the jury had not reached a unanimous verdict on manslaughter, but had reached a unanimous not guilty verdict on two of the three indictments. The second degree murder charge, as well as leaving the scene with injury or death. Now here's a look at the document. The affidavit refers to the person as juror B, not revealing if this is a man or a woman. Juror B also told the defense that even if Karen Reed hit John O'Keefe with her SUV, quote, no one on this jury thought she hit him on purpose. This comes after four jurors reached out to the prosecution last week, leaving voicemail and emails for the district attorney's office, confirming they were unanimous on charges one and three, unanimous on not guilty. This could explain why the jury said they were hopelessly deadlocked, leading to Judge Canoni declaring a mistrial. Judge Canoni, despite our commitment to the duty entrusted to us, we find ourselves deeply divided by fundamental differences in our opinions and state of mind. The divergence in our views are not rooted in a lack of understanding or effort, but deeply held convictions that each of us carry, ultimately leading to a point where consensus is unattainable. We recognize the weight of this admission and the implications it holds. Well, we are gearing up for Friday when Karen Reed is going to be back inside of a courtroom for a motion to dismiss hearing in front of Judge Canoni. Let's bring in our panel to discuss this. We have two excellent attorneys who can break this down for us. Attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borghardt and in Massachusetts, trial attorney and former homicide prosecutor in Norfolk County, where this is all happening. Richard Grundy is with us as well. It's great to have you both on this morning. Franz, let me start with you. When you hear that judge read the note where this jury is saying we are hopelessly deadlocked, is there any explanation in your mind why they didn't submit 
a partial verdict. Hey, we are unanimous on some of the charges, but there's just one where we are hopelessly deadlocked. I think that you have, you have a few things. You have the fact that the defense and the prosecution, nor the judge, none of them polled the jury. That's number one. And the question is going to become, did the failure to poll the jury create an obstacle to what we call a tacit acquittal on those two counts, if in fact she was tacitly acquitted? Um, the form may have been confusing, but they clearly knew how to ask questions. Um, and they clearly were articulate with their feelings and thoughts in their notes. So I don't know why they didn't just say, look, we agree as to count one and three that she's not guilty. Had they done that, we would be having a different conversation. Totally different conversation. And we wouldn't have jurors reaching out about a verdict that didn't happen and a case that's already been declared a mistrial. Richard, you've got insider knowledge as to this courtroom, perhaps the jury instructions, how they're written. I don't think I've ever seen a jury instruction about partial verdict instructing the jury on how to deliver a partial verdict. But what can you tell us about why you think the jury seemed to be very confused, but now really emphatic about, no, we were unanimous on not guilty for two charges? So I think the first thing we have to remember is that the jurors, no matter how intelligent um, are lay people, um, unless of course there's an attorney on the, on the jury, which we're not aware of. Um, so this is new to the group at least, <clears throat> and they rely on the court and the attorneys for the guidance in how they do their job. So I think it, for the jurors sake, I think they were looking at this as we have a whole be before us, W-H-O-L-E, and it's our job to take care of the whole case that's before us. And we've chipped away at it, but we have not accomplished that, and that's what they reported to the court. We cannot reach a verdict on this case, and that's what you've asked us to do. Um, so the, the idea of a partial verdict, the idea of chipping away at it, that was never really broached with them. I think they understood that when they got to that manslaughter, they had to work down through the lesser included. But again, that was a piece of the whole, which they didn't complete. So I think that's what their mindset was. Now, this doesn't get the prosecution of the court um, out of the defense's argument that they're presenting now. But I think it was clear just as far as men's ray mindset of the defense was, we put our best case forward here that the prosecution did not. We were expecting a pretty quick not guilty on this. And from the first hint that the jury was hung when just attorney Anetti was there and immediately said, um, give him to a Rodriguez, which is the first step, necessary step to working towards a hung jury, that they wanted to get that hung jury. A hung jury is not a conviction, so it is a form of win for the defense, and they were hungry to get that. So I think in response to Franz's um, question with respect to what everybody was doing, I think that their mindset was we got to get this hung jury and live to fight another day. Uh, it, it, again, um, they have written a, a motion that brings up some salient points that are going to have to be addressed, and they're not going to be easily addressed uh, in this matter. And I, I think you're going to see this go to the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts at a minimum. Such a mess after already a difficult trial, this jury unable to at least tell the court about unanimity on some of those charges still hung on one of them. We haven't gotten that cleared up at all. It seems like they still did not think that she hit him on purpose. Regardless, that's a difficult position for this uh, this prosecution to be in. And I want to go back to Trooper Joe Paul. This was their reconstructionist who talked about how the crime scene, the accident scene looked and how it related to John O'Keefe's injuries. Let's play that. And I want to get your reaction on the other side. So the vehicle was traveling in reverse. And how fast was the vehicle traveling and over what distance? The vehicle traveled up to 24 miles per hour and approximately 62 feet. What if anything occurred then? The, uh, the right rear of the Lexus struck the pedestrian John O'Keefe. 
and post-collision, what, if anything, uh, occurred with regard to Mr. O'Keefe? Mr. O'Keefe was projected forward and to the left along the front yard of 34 Ferry Road. Franz, if these jurors are correct, if the reports that we're getting out now, which I think we can we can take them at their word now because they've reached out to defense attorneys, to the district attorney's office, even an independent reporter has heard directly from a juror saying we were unanimous on second degree murder for not guilty, meaning we don't think there was this murderous element to it. That means they completely didn't believe what Trooper Joe Paul had to say about the speed and about the distance. Your thoughts? Well, that's that's the pickle the, the, the Commonwealth's going to be in, right? Mm -hmm. If, in fact, the judge says, or the court, or a higher court, and I agree, it's going to be a higher court that makes this decision, says, you know, you can't try her for, for second-degree murder, that she's been acquitted for that, they can move forward possibly for the lower charge, but you're absolutely right. What they have to kind of do is pivot from she wanted to hit him, she meant to hit him, and she hit him to, well, maybe this was an accident or maybe this was something else. And and look, in anywhere else in the world, this would be a case that would resolve itself with a negotiated plea. That's not going to happen in this case. It will likely be another trial. But yeah, they did not believe that expert. Of course, the other side of it is they didn't believe the conspiracy that, that, that a whole bunch of people like jumped him and killed him either. So that didn't work for the defense. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens as we go forward. Richard Grundy, this uh, prosecution, we always say with the state, with the Commonwealth, they are supposed to seek justice, not just a guilty verdict. Even if the judge does not throw out the second degree and leaving the scene of a crime uh, in the murder charge in this case, do you think in the interest of justice, if a, a prosecution knows that these jurors did not believe that, they across the board, 12 people believe that she was not guilty of that, should they, sua sponte, on their own, should they decide to drop the second degree charge? So, Janae, let me say, um, and I've said this from the first day at opening statements with Vinny, this case is overcharged. There was no second degree to be had here. Um, I think it, uh, it made their job that much more difficult. It distracted the jurors. You know, at the end of the day, um, according to one of the jurors, it was nine people who were ready to convict on the manslaughter. Um, the second degree should have been excised at some point in time. So now I think the difficulty is, is that they don't want to set a precedent that, hey, you know, everybody out there who has a case tried in Norfolk County that results in a hung jury or guilty, round up your jurors, get a handful of them to say, no, no, that's not what we wanted, and then maybe we'll get rid of a charge. Uh, so. Um, there certainly is an interest of justice there. We got to also appreciate here that I, if, if my reading is correct, we've heard or the parties have heard directly from two, perhaps three jurors directly. Um, and the, the other is this other people who spoke to a juror or spoke to somebody who spoke to a juror. I don't question the information that's being presented at this time. But the process by which this decision is going to be made is going to be precedent setting. And at a minimum, I think what the courts are going to first have to do is decide if tw these 12 jurors all say we had reached a firm decision ready to deliver to the court, the missing piece is that report to the court, the opportunity to poll the jury, the opportunity for either party to ask each juror to be polled that they reached a conviction or, or, or this decision to acquit on these two charges. Then if, if we're going to find that as presenting a, a argument that's ripe to be allowed, then we have to hear from all 12 jurors. I don't think they can take the word from any one, two, three, four, five jurors. So that first decision is if those 12 agree is there meat on the bone to go forward? And if the answer to that question is yes, 
then we're going to have to talk to 12 jurors. So you're saying we could see something similar to what we saw in the Alec Murdoch case, where every single juror came into that courtroom to testify about what had been happening in these filings leading up to it. We will see. There's always surprises in this trial. Richard Grundy, thank you so much for lending us your time this morning, sharing your insight. We know we have to say goodbye to you, Franz, sticking around. We have a lot more ahead. We're talking more about this case later in the hour but also how this week's motions hearing could tip the scales for Karen Reed. Still ahead, we're talking about a deputy who's accused of gunning down Sonia Massey. He claims he and she intended deadly harm when she said the words, quote, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Is that defense going to work at trial? We'll break it down. Plus murder charges announced against security officers at a hotel. They were accused of pinning down and killing a man. An accused bellhop speaks out. That's next. Join Court TV's Vinny Politan. In every story, in every trial, every case, there's at least two sides to it. To dive into the latest. Oh my God. And breaking true crime stories. This was a very targeted, very personal attack. Inside, I've never seen that in a discovery. I've been incarcerated three years. And outside of the courtroom. She's a psychopath. Now. Let's look at the other side of all of that. Vinny Politan investigates tonight, 9, 8 central, only on Court TV. Now for what's trending in true crime. The former Illinois deputy who shot and killed Sonia Massey says he believed that when Massey said, quote, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, that she intended deadly harm. That's according to the deputy's field report released this week. The now fired deputy, Sean Grayson, said, quote, I interpreted this to mean she was going to kill me, end quote. Video of the controversial shooting was captured on body camera. Shots were fired when Massey went to remove a pot of boiling water from the stove. Away from your hot steaming water. Away from hot steaming water? Yeah. Oh, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Better not. I swear to God, I'll shoot you in your face. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Drop the pot. Drop the pot. Drop the pot. This morning, we are asking, how could rebuke you sound life? Threatening, as this officer is now claiming in his report. Let's bring in our guest. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borghardt still with us. Criminal defense and civil rights attorney Casey Early is joining us. And domestic violence expert and former law enforcement officer Claudia King with us as well. Good to have you all here. Casey, let me start with you. We could hear her saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Her voice doesn't sound threatening to me. Your thoughts on whether or not this could sound life-threatening? It can never sound life-threatening. It's unfortunate because that term, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, is not only found, rebuke, is not only found in the West, uh, Webster Dictionary, but it's in the Bible. That's when the Lord rebuked Jesus. So even if he didn't know the terminology, just breaking down that term, just basic English, rebuke, it, it, it expresses strong disapproval. And if you heard the conversation prior, he assumed that she was going to do something negative with that boiling water. But even so, even if she had uh, made a quote threat, did she have the present ability to, to throw that water? There's no way that defense is going to fly. And it's unfortunate because we're not even going to get into his history as a deputy or his history, his prior criminal history. But that is not only a weak defense. Uh, I'm looking at a, a quick and swift guilty. Claudia King, former law enforcement, your thoughts on this field report from the Illinois officer? Absolutely ridiculous. I can't even imagine that he wrote that down because in all of my training and practical exercises, never was rebuke a weapon that could have been used against us. Uh, she did not have the the ability to cause any harm to him in that moment. And even though we can't see when she was knelt down and he claimed he moved to see if there were any weapons, at that point, he would have been able to see that there were no weapons. And yeah, burning water could hurt and it could cause damage, but it's not going to be death or extreme bodily injury. So I think this is ridiculous. This guy never should have had a badge in the first place. And I hope he is in prison for the rest of his life. 
Uh, Franz, I've got to get you to wear your criminal defense hat in this case. Um, and I'm going to add an element of this report. This is being reported by the Daily Mail that he indicated that he looked down to see liquid that had hit his boots and observed steam coming from the cabinet area, something we can't see on body camera. But if this is in fact in the report and if it is in fact something that happened, is there any possibility or way that a defense attorney could use this to convince a jury that he is innocent? A good defense attorney who's dancing for their lunch is going to possibly not go all the way to self-defense. What a better argument might be is a manslaughter, heat of the moment. He thought one thing, but he was wrong. Um, I, I just, it's problematic for the reasons already stated to argue self-defense, not guilty. Um, now, now look. Now look, if that's what the client wants, we can argue that. It, it's just, I think a better path for this def defendant is, is I didn't have the intent to kill her. It was it was a heat, you know, heat of the moment, heat of the passion. I didn't know what she was reaching for. I panicked and that's why this happened. It's not a great justification to be sure, but if I have to play defense attorney, I have to play defense attorney. I appreciate you at least taking that role, Franz. This is a difficult one, and those who are watching this video are, are really incensed by what happened. We're going to move now to another trending case, another case of an officer-involved incident, this one with security officers. Four hotel employees have now been charged with being a party to felony murder in the death of Devontae Mitchell. It comes more than a month after this father's death and the demands from his family for justice. Now, these charges were announced late yesterday after a new video video from inside the Milwaukee Hotel was released. You see it here, showing the moments leading up to Mitchell's death. But what it doesn't show is the initial encounter. Mitchell's death was ruled a homicide by restraint and asphyxia and toxic effects of cocaine and methamphetamine. My son was standing there with his hands up like this. They dragging him through the, through the hallway, pulling, kicking, hitting him with brooms. Oh my God, clothes coming off of him, punching him in the face. Oh, that was horrible. You guys showed us all these other videos, but the main, the most important one, you know, like, where's that video at and why won't they release it? So this morning we're asking our panel, should the hotel have to release all of the video, including the initial moments to the public? Uh, Franz Borgard, I'm going to start again with you. Uh, what do you think about whether or not this should be released to the public um, and whether or not it's likely in the hands of police at this point? I, I think it's probably in the hands of police. I hope it's in the hands of police at the very least. Um, I don't think the hotel is under any obligation to publish anything at this point, although it's disingenuous if you start playing some of the videos and then not all of the videos. That's why I always tell clients and, and, and entities, don't play anything. Let someone else do that work for you um, because now we have a very good question. Where is that video? That's the most important video. And if there's something on that video that doesn't look good for the hotel, it's going to be really bad uh, for the case. Mm, Claudia, before I get to you, I want to play some sound from one of the men who's involved in this incident. He did speak out the bellhop there at the hotel. Let's listen. I never struck Devontae Mitchell, and I showed no act of violence whatsoever towards Devontae Mitchell. All I did was held him down. And if, and if I'm wrong for that, I mean, m may God treat me in, in, in a proper way that I should be treated. Uh, Claudia, talk about this video and the acts of these four different people who were involved in varying ways with the pinning down of Devontae Mitchell. So the gentleman that just spoke, even if he was only holding him down, if he was doing that while other people were beating Devontae Mitchell, that's not okay. Then he was a party to the assault and ultimately to Devontae Mitchell's death. So I just don't think that's a great defense. We really need to see that first video because without it, we have no context. And I don't understand if Devante was doing something wrong, why didn't they just get him out on the sidewalk and go back in and close and lock those doors? So it doesn't make sense to me right now at all. 
Casey, uh, your thoughts, um, especially from the position of a civil rights attorney, we know the family is represented by Ben Crump, a civil rights attorney, and they're seeking to get this video. How do you go about getting it or imp impressing on a hotel to release it to the public? Well, if this is going to be a civil case, obviously, once the uh, lawsuit is filed, then you do what's called a discovery. So it will eventually be released into the proper hands. I'm not so much concerned of it being released to the public because that's not where the final verdict will come down, whether it's the criminal matter or the civil rights matter. But bottom line, just seeing that snippet is bad enough. It doesn't matter what happened before uh, or after. It's, it's what occurred uh, at the hands of the employees of this hotel. So I do expect that there will be some liability, not just for the hotel workers, but the hotel itself, if they had any prior knowledge of these employees prior to uh, retaining them. All right, negligent hiring of security, uh, many things that could be on the table here. Franz Borkhardt, I know we have to say goodbye to you. Thank you for sharing your expertise this hour. Claudia and Casey are sticking around. We have much more on opening statements. Stand up for me. Put your hands behind your back. Am I going to jail? Yes, you are. I do not know. I don't make that determination. We all watched this together yesterday, and now the decision is in. A Florida judge sentenced Brandon Deppa for a violent attack on a teacher aide. Did the judge get it right? We're going to spotlight this multi-layered case after the break. And later, Karen Reed due back in court on Friday. How will the defense's motion to dismiss, in this case, tip the scales of justice? I had five broken ribs and three of them were broken twice. Put your hands behind your back. Am I going to jail? Yes, you are. Every time he gets angry, he doesn't assault somebody. It's just sometimes when he gets angry, he assaults somebody. It was very um, traumatic. This morning, we are shining a spotlight on the sentencing of Brendan Deppa. It's had a lot of you talking on social media. On Tuesday, he was sentenced to five years in prison. That'll be followed by 15 years of supervised probation. Now, a viral video showing his violent attack on a teacher's aide back in February of 2023 pushed this teen who suffers from autism uh, disorder. Uh, it pushed him under the microscope. After hearing from several witnesses, the judge in this case sentenced the 18-year-old for that brutal assault. Based on the facts of this case, I do find that Mr. Depa would qualify, that is by age, he would qualify for youthful offender, but because of the nature of the charge and how this incident actually occurred in all of the circumstances, having carefully reviewed that, I find that a youthful offender uh, sentence would not be appropriate here. So we're left then with, okay, what do we do with regard to the con? Uh, the context of criminal adult sanctioning. The court sentences Mr. Depa to 60 months of Department of Corrections, followed by 15 years Department of Corrections supervised probation. Now, with regard to the initial DOC sentence, giving him credit for his time served, when he goes to the reception center, I'm directing that the DOC conduct a full mental health assessment as Dr. Klein indicated, they would accept from the court and develop an individual service plan with regard to all of the uh, diagnosis that Mr. Deppa has received. Let's discuss the fallout from the Deppa sentence with criminal defense and civil rights attorney Casey Early is with us and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Shannon Archer. So good to have you both here. Uh, Shannon, let me start with you. This judge decided that this was not a defendant who qualified for the youthful offender status, even though he was 17 at the time and suffering from autism spectrum disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, unspecified schizophrenia spectrum, all of that the judge agreed he was suffering from at the time, but went with five years. Your thoughts on this decision? Well, I think one of the things that I focused in on was this idea that he had 
prior batteries or assaults in his history and to the extent that he didn't deal with those when he had them that's one factor that the sentencing court is going to take into consideration when we look at this not only are we looking at the rehabilitation of the offender but we're also looking at the protection of the public and so for this case uh, it sounds like they are setting him up uh, for success the best way that they can with the individualized mental health plan uh, but they're also protecting the public with that term of incarceration. Uh, Casey, your thoughts on this decision not to go with youthful offender status, the five year sentence, but also this 15 years of supervised probation? Yeah, I, I kind of think that the judge's hands were tied, but I would have uh, liked it to be a youthful offender sentence because uh, the school failed him. There was an IEP in place and um, right, this, all, this incident could have been prevented. And I feel like based on his numerous mental illnesses, this child being a child with special needs, I mean, this occurred when he was 17 years old. He could have, this could have been a juvenile case. He was tried as an adult. So to put him in the adult system, which is meant to punish, as opposed to the juvenile system, which is meant to rehabilitate, I just feel like they looked at him, although they knew about his previous mental illnesses, they kind of uh, pushed that aside because he had numerous batteries. Yeah, he had numerous batteries because he had a plan, but no one assisted him in going through with that plan and 15 years of probation is entirely uh, too long for this incident. I think he was punished for having mental illness and was not properly treated at the time. His dangerousness was something that the judge mentioned multiple times and he referenced Dr. Greg Pritchard. This was the state's uh, psychologist, the expert who talked about his opinion about his ability to be rehabilitated. Let's listen back to Dr. Pritchard and then the judge using that in his decision. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not Mr. Deppa is dangerous? Yeah, I mean, my, my opinion is he is dangerous. I don't think that a professional could really see it any other way, given Mr. Deppa's history. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's, it's just this a cro chronic aggression. It's, it's occurring since he was really young. You know, I saw his mother said he started having behaviors at three. I'm not sure if that was aggressive behaviors, but... Certainly when he got to school initially, part of the reason he couldn't stay there is because of aggressive conduct. So aggression in the school initially, aggression in the home, aggression in the community, aggression at uh, Springbrook, aggression at Echo, aggression at Matanzas High. So what that tells you is that's part of <laughs> Mr. Deppa's response style is physical aggression. So in that sense, Yes, I believe he's dangerous. Shannon, the judge incorporated that in the finding when talking about this sentence and why he decided the way that he did. Uh, but I want to ask you about the other options, uh, possibly, because there really weren't that many options for this judge. But we have had our viewers asking about why this defendant wouldn't be placed in a mental health facility uh, where he could get treatment and not perhaps be in the prison system. What are the options when you have this criminal offense, you have a victim, and you have charges that he pleaded no contest to? Yeah, I think each state and jurisdiction are different uh, about what mental health services that we provide. A lot of mental health hospitals don't have the security in place that would be able to protect the rest of the patients uh, and the staff from somebody who has it aggressive tendencies to this extent. So even if there is an option for mental health placement, uh, there would need to be that increased security to ensure that everybody is safe during the course of the treatment. I wanna listen back to a particularly poignant part of this testimony yesterday because the defense did put on the adoptive mother of Brendan Deppa. She had him since he was five months old and she pleaded with the judge as to what an ulterior option could be. He's felt abandoned by his birth family, and he felt abandoned by us when I sent him to South Carolina. He struggles with autism and behavioral issues. But other than that year where we had just extreme chaos from the medical stuff going on, I was able to manage Brendan because I knew Brendan and I knew his triggers and I knew um, his needs and his strengths. And I beg you 
to let him come home with me. I want my son back. Court TV did reach out to Brendan Deppa's mother. She declined to talk publicly at this time. She said she didn't want to make things tougher on her son at this point. But Shannon, I know we're going to have to let you go soon, so I want to get your reaction to this mother in court and uh, just what can be the takeaways from a case like this? Look, I understand. I'm a mother, too. Of course, you're going to want to do everything that you can to help your children, uh, but making her responsible for him with someone with this level of uh, concern and aggression, uh, that does not put her in a good position either. And she doesn't have uh, the capability to care for the for him to the extent that he needs that care. Uh, her love can only go so far. And while I understand that, uh, he needs something more than what she can provide. And we certainly heard that through her testimony that she's had difficulty throughout managing him. Shannon, thank you so much for weighing in for us for this story. We have to let you go now. But Casia, you're sticking around for tipping the scales that's still ahead. Karen Reed and her attorneys return to court on Friday. They're hoping to get two of the charges against her dismissed. What could tip the scales in her favor? Was a reporter brutally murdered for digging too deep? His death was absolutely devastating. The suspect, the former politician and subject of the victim's story on corruption. Can you tell us anything? Now will Robert tell us go from elected official to convicted killer? Once all the evidence comes out, it'll be clear as day. Is it possible that bad press is a motive for murder? The investigative reporter murder trial. Live coverage begins next week on Court TV. She just repeated the phrase over and over again, I hit him, I hit him. Google hypothermia, Google how long it takes to die in the cold. Did you either cut up the SIM card or rip it up? Cut it up or broke it. I observed a damaged rear right a tail light. No nude so far. I hate that man, I truly hate him. These injuries were from an animal attack, possibly a large dog. Yes. As Karen Reed's team heads back to court on Friday there in Dedham, Massachusetts, we are wondering what could tip the scales in their favor. We know the defense has filed a motion to dismiss two of the charges, the second degree murder charge and the leaving the scene of a crime involving death or injury charge. And that some jurors have come forward to say that the jury did reach unanimous verdicts of not guilty on those two charges. Here's one of Reed's attorneys, David Giannetti, talking about what comes next. Do you think the second trial, we're really going to get to that point? January 27th. Is it going to happen again? I'm, I'm uh, hoping that the DA's office comes to their senses and realizes that they have no clue. How far would you take the devil's advocate the charge? Oh, this will be appealed to the highest I'm not, court. I'm not, the DA's office has discretion to drop the charges as we think that they should, but um, they may be forced to drop them, either by this judge or by another judge. Appealed to the highest court, he says. The defense could ask the judge, the trial judge, at this upcoming hearing to interview the jury or to poll the jury, which could mean those jurors would have to return to the courtroom and sit in the witness stand. Could this tip the scales and force the judge's hand to dismiss these charges? Let's bring back in our panel here to discuss criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney Casia Early and domestic violence expert and former law enforcement officer Claudia King. Casia, I want to get your thoughts on where we are at this Karen Reed case. We all watched this trial, the opposing sides, the opposing theories about what happened. And now we are hearing jurors say they had actually come to a decision on two charges. What do you think Judge Canoni is going to do when she hears those oral arguments on Friday? You know, there's a possibility that the judge can subpoena the jurors and get them to testify. Oftentimes, judges don't like to get involved in jury deliberations, but this is an important part because apparently there was a unanimous vote. I mean, I literally just got out of trial where uh, there was a holdout uh, juror and ultimately we reached a, they reached a verdict of not guilty and I had the opportunity of speaking to the foreman. And you, you rarely get that opportunity to speak to the jurors, especially the person, uh, you know, that's usually in charge of the deliberation. So I do believe that if these jurors are subpoenaed, there's a possibility that the state is not going to try it. However, I do believe they're going to wait to the final hour to make that announcement and just have her on edge. 
Uh, Claudia King, your thoughts on where we are with this trial? I know you did analysis for us throughout the Karen Reed trial. Did you think we would be here where we have jurors who actually say they did come to a unanimous decision? I definitely did not think we would be here. This was not on my bingo card for sure. Um, but I agree with Casia. I think, you know, the judge has the opportunity to potentially speak with the jurors. And if we are truly after justice, then I think that's what she needs to do. We need to figure out if that's what the jury intended. You know, I agree they probably should have put that on their notes or indicated that they had come to a decision in, in some parts and not on others, but they didn't. And so here we are at this point. I also think that the prosecution needs to look at potentially dropping these charges and moving forward with the lower charge. Because again, if they're after justice, then they need to listen to what's being said right now by the jurors that we've heard from. What's probably also going to be under scrutiny is how Judge Canoni handled things there when these jurors were sending notes and then they were dismissed. Let's listen back to one of those notes being read and ultimately the declaring of a mistrial. Judge Canoni, despite our rigorous efforts, we continue to find ourselves at an impasse. Our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided. Some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Conversely, others find the evidence fails to meet this standard and does not sufficiently establish the necessary elements of the charges. The deep division is not due to a lack of effort or diligence, but rather a sincere adherence to our individual principles and moral convictions. To continue to deliberate would be futile and only serve to force us to compromise these deeply held beliefs. I'm not going to do that to you folks. Your service is complete. I'm declaring a mistrial in this case. I'll be in to see you privately in a few minutes. So thank you so much for your service. And with that, the jury was dismissed, Casia. There wasn't a lot of time for the attorneys to put anything different on the record. And here's a look at just video of what was unfolding after this happened. We know David Yannetti had already said we need to declare a mistrial. They need to be read the dynamite charge and we need to move on. And there was some interaction between Karen Reed and Paul O'Keefe. She hugs her father. You see that there, those moments. But this was what happened immediately after. They knew the judge was going back to talk to these jurors. She said it there on the record, but there is a divide in terms of what the prosecution wants to happen going forward. They say it was a mistrial. There was no asking of a polling, but the defense saying they were owed that opportunity. Your thoughts, Casilla? I agree, especially when there is a mistrial. You just want to put everything on the record. And if you were denied that opportunity, then, you know, we should err on the side of the defense. Again, the presumption of innocence, they're cloaked with the presumption of innocence. So I do believe that if the defense did not have that ability, then uh, again, this should be in, in preferred for the defense. So it's unfortunate that uh, we've come down to this. But again, I do believe in the search of justice, the prosecution should take a real hard look at their case and make that just determination as to whether or not they're going to try this case again. I don't know, Casey, I'm looking at the video. It doesn't look like they are concerned about trying to make sure the record is preserved. Uh, Claudia <laughs> King, just some final <laughs> thoughts on what the state's case may look like if uh, these two charges are, well, whatever the judge decides, there's going to be a different case in front of them once they retry this case, mainly because their lead investigator, Michael Proctor, he is now no longer lead, no longer on this case, moved to a different department. Other officers who took the stand are now under investigation. How does that impact the state's case, the Commonwealth's case, rather, going forward? I think it impacts it very heavily because now they have lost or have ethical issues surrounding the lead investigator and several other officers who were involved. And so the state has really got, or the Commonwealth has really got to look at how they're going to proceed because if the murder charge is taken off, then they can't talk about intent. They can't talk about how angry she was and she purposefully hit them. So it, it's going to be an entirely different case. And I just don't know if it's one, again, that they'll be able to win with all of the additional things that have surfaced 
since the original trial. Absolutely will be a different trial. Casey, okay, early. Claudia King, thank you very much for all of your insight this hour. We'll see you again real soon. That's it for opening statements. You can watch or share this episode. Just go to CourtTV.com, click on the Shows tab. Up next, Court TV Live begins, and we're tracking three different trials. Stay with us. You're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice.